and welcome to Brewcast. Happy February twenty fourth. I don't even know what day it is. Sure, but, uh, it is a Thursday evening in White Death, Ohio. Uh, <laughs> uh, joining me, what to my left, my right? I don't even know. To be real honest, Chris is down below. Um, Chris, welcome. What's going on, fellas? It's been. Yeah, that- it's been two weeks, right? It's been two weeks, that exactly. Right. And uh, the other person there, the owner, the person that makes all this happen, Joey Brumley from HBYOB. Welcome. I am drinking a homebrewed beer, a Saison barrel aged, and I believe a cherry. It was a Saison and cherry wood oak aged. Very pleasant. Thank you very much, uh, Chuck, for bringing that in for me. Uh, I, he brought me two. I've had one, so this is not today, but I've had one uh, a couple days ago, had one today. Very good. Thank you. Oh, well, good. Again, another perk of the job. Are you still, uh, looking for employee? Yes. Please right. uh, apply. If you would have an interest of working here, uh, positions going to be Monday through Friday, full time. Oh, Oh, oh. Oh, or, two part-time, uh, or two however, part-time however or, or yeah. three or four, t- four quarter times, whatever it takes. Yeah. All right. Let's get right into it. We're going to talk about recipes. How, why uh, can you change them? Where they come from? How do you make your own up? I got multiple questions. Good. Thank you. Um, and this is probably definitely a good show. I wanted Chris for sure to be here because Chris does seem to always change his recipes. Um, maybe that's maybe. just my, you know, just what I feel. It just seems like uh, he, he likes to do that. But my first question will be for Joey, the, the owner. How many of your customers percentage wise are just coming in with a recipe they found versus a recipe that they came up with on their own? Um. I mean, it's tough to say because who knows what they plucked off the internet or a book or something. But most people do come in knowing what they want to brew. So did they come in saying, I want to brew this tight? Okay, let's go another step. The person who doesn't know for sure what he wants to brew or or what the recipe is, are they asking you? Are they saying, I want to, I want to make a Sierra Nevada style. I want to make a porter. Can you help me? Um, is that one of the other options as far as what people will come in and ask? Yeah, I mean, we have a recipe book here. We've got extract recipes ready to go. So most of the time, I just tell people, oh, I would say a good part of the time, it would just be, what what do you like to drink? Or what beer are you a fan of? And I can point you something that's uh, not a clone recipe, but something within the realm of what you're talking about. Right. Or and Chris, what, what about you? When, you? when you decide to create a beer, um, do you find a recipe first? Do you find a beer style? Do you find just you already have something and you want to make, you know, I have a leftover couple ingredients. Let me figure something out to make with it. Uh, I think you just listed like all the possible options as to how I'd come up with the recipe. Sometimes it is that, but for the most part, um, it's most of my recipes that I come up with, they're geared towards the competitions that Joey and I go to. So uh, since I normally go into the experimental category, I'm always thinking about something wild. Uh, What was it like? putting pineapple, you know, directly into the mash and just like all sorts of other stuff. Like this year, I'm thinking about experimenting with uh, with mangoes because I'm like all about like this mango flavored uh, beer that Joey gave me a, a few weeks ago when we saw him. Uh, but that's typically like where I start. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, another another avenue that I like to use is just sifting through some of the homebrew forums. Folks will be like, hey, you know, I'll see a picture of something. And Joey and I, we've had this conversation beforehand about a lot of folks, they like to they like to eat with their eyes. So if they see a beer that looks good, uh, like an example would be uh, there is a brewery out in I think it's like an East Coast brewery. I think Treehouse Brewery, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, they make this uh, beer called an Orange Julius. And if you saw just a picture of that, I mean, it's just like the glass just looks absolutely perfect. I mean, the beer itself, it looks like just a bright orange, like a hazy uh, IPA. And it just looks juicy. It looks fruity. And it's just like when you see that picture, it's like, okay, that's what I want to make. Well, then you start just like kind of hunting around for who's made something similar, what ingredients went into it. And then you make your own like small adjustments. That's what I do is make my own little adjustments here and there to for my palate. But yeah, I mean, those are the two basic ways that I typically like to go about coming up with recipes. All right. So 
which I, I will go in a little deeper here in a minute. Have you created a recipe on your own from scratch? Yeah. Or have you always started with guidelines? Uh, no, I, I would say I have, yes, created my own recipe from scratch based off of what I wanted the beer to look like, how I wanted to taste the general area of ABV that I wanted to be in, just all those metrics, because I, I, am, I have a technical background, so I like to start off with what numbers that I'm trying to hit. So if I want to be in the 6% ABV range and I want it to have uh, my SRM to be like fairly light. So I want it to look like it's like we were just talking about with that right. lighter colored uh, hazy type beer. So if I, those are the metrics that I want to hit, I know I can kind of like back calculate or kind of back out what type of ingredients I would want in order to hit that. And has, that gotten, I, simple, has that gotten simpler or harder to do as you've gotten more knowledge of brewing? I think simpler uh, for putting together the ingredients. What becomes harder is as you refine your technique and as you learn more about just the brewing process in general, like you can get into just, you can go through a, a massive rabbit hole about when you're supposed to, what temperatures you're supposed to mash your grains at, like where's it 154, 152, 150, like whatever the case would do, step mash or like all the, all those other techniques. And you can get into that conversation, but even from a high level standpoint, just saying, all right, this is what I want. This is what I need. This is the general area that I want to, uh, this is the, like the general steps I need to take in order to get there. That's typically where I, I like to start. But when I first started off, yeah, I was one of the same, like just like anybody else that first started off brewing, you get your, was it Northern Brewer, like step-by-step, step, you know, like one, two, three, four, you know, sanitize your stuff, do this, pour your grains in, get your temperature to this much and all that. But then as you learn more and you start understanding the why. All right behind each of the steps, then it becomes a little bit easier for you to say, okay, well, I can do this, I can do that, I can tweak this, and so on and so forth. Right, because see, when I started, Joey knows, I did kits or the, uh, you know, different things, and I, I I, just always would, you know, you know, they'd call them, they'd call them weird things, you know, you knew they were a knockoff of some other, you know, they yeah. wouldn't call it Sierra Nevada, they would call it something else, or, um, Nira you know, Nevada. <laughs> yeah, uh, they had crazy names, so you knew, you know, cowboy lager or American you know, pale ale. Or if we have a recipe here, it's meant to be like a zombie dust. We call it pixie dust. So, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, so Joey, if I come in to you though, I don't even know if I want to come up with my own recipe. Um, and and I guess, like Chris said, you really could start with anything as being the main. Let's say I want to come in and let's just say I want to make a low alcohol beer. That's my only, um, uh, the only kind of stipulation. Uh, you know, um, I want to make something that's low alcohol, but, you know, has some flavor. You know, obviously, as someone who works in the industry, is that something you'd be able to help somebody with to build on just that one premise? Yeah, I mean, any... Anything you want to bring in, and I mean, within some form of reason, I can usually point you somewhat in the general direction. Like I said, we've got recipes here. Google's always at our disposal, so we can always look up, you know, like in your case, I can always just type in, you know, truly what you said, low alcohol, you know, all grain recipe or extract recipe. Um, the I do know there's actually a new yeast I was that was brought to my attention not too long ago that's supposed to make like a virtually zero alcohol beer so there's all kinds of cool things oh, really? and it's always ever evolving um but generally when people come in and, I, and they ask me you know hey i want to brew a, you know most of the time they know what style they want to brew so then we just kind of got to go from there um i tell people all the time one of my favorite movies of all times inception and uh i don't know if you've seen that movie or not but the in the movie the uh the person who's like an artist says, you got to paint from what you know, you know, you start from what you know. Um, so same thing, like, you know, do you like a stout or, you know, a porter or cream ale, whatever the style may be. It's one of those, we have a great book here. It's called brewing classic styles. Um, it's always sits behind the counter. So it, a lot of times it's, let's start from there and, and kind of, you know, go from there, you know, back to like, you got to paint from what you know, um, same thing. You kind of got to get inspiration from what you know. So having good resources, like I said, we've got multiple books here in the store. You know, the internet. Uh, Chris mentioned like some of the other uh, online vendors. Actually, we'll show you their full blown recipe. The AHA has a great resources. Um, I do like a um, 
I can't even think of the name of the beer, but there's a beer that basically they've went and visited the people of the brewery. They gave them very helpful hints. Um, another great resource would be like Mad Tree, uh, a brewery. What is that? Cincinnati, Chris? Yep. I was just down there uh, a couple weeks ago. You can get on their website and they truly have a homebrew version on their website. Like you yep. can go to their website. Um, if you guys want to chat, I'll even kind of show you. It's, pr it's pretty cool. Um, so uh, like, like I said, to me, when it comes to recipe formulation, there's great resources like Beersmith. Beersmith is really good. And there's a couple other um, softwares that can help you stay within the style guidelines. Uh, so there's all kinds of resources out there. You're muted. Thank you. But the so then the next thing would be so low alcohol versus then like you said if someone just comes in and says they want to make a knockoff of of something, um, mm -hmm. it, is there usually just one or two? What's the main ingredient that's going to affect flavor or style the most? Is it is it the the grain you're using, the the yeast, um, the hop, w what affects it, or is it just a combination of all? And it's you know all important, Chris. What 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 plays the biggest factor? Uh, f depends on the style, I would say, because if you're like for the stuff that I was talking about earlier, if you're talking about trying to make, let's say, like what I was talking about, like the orange Julius clone, I would say that a lot of the hops that you'd either have available to you or whatever folks like might suggest, I mean, that would probably control a lot of what you're going to, like a lot of the flavor profile that you're going to wind up getting. Because for a lot of those hazy IPAs, those any IPAs, like things of that nature, I mean, they are so like hop dependent because you're looking to get that, you know, that the citra or like whatever the case may be regarding the hops variant that you select for that beer or what's whatever is recommended. So for that case, yeah. But if you're talking about I don't like a lager or a pale ale. I mean, in those cases, yes. In the, in those cases, the the grain bill that you wind up selecting for it that would be the driver for a lot of your flavor. So I think it's really more style dependent than anything else. So can you see? Can you see what I see there, guys? Yeah. yeah. So like for example, I'm at Mad Tree's website, and this is their low calorie citrus IPA, which low calorie and low alcohol kind of goes side and side. But truly, you can just hit right here, download recipe. Uh, you can't see it because my screen share. Uh, hold on. Um, oh, that just gives you like a PDF. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Share. Huh. Uh, hold That's on. pretty cool. Shoot. Yeah. It, it, so, I, I've never seen that before. Is is that common or that's rare to for a brewery to to offer that? Um, so I would say it's not normal, but but seriously, this I I clicked on that link from what I showed you earlier, and this is what came right up. I mean, basically like a homebrew uh, it even says five gallons so ramble on by mad tree wow. you can just go to their website and it gives you a really intuitive uh um that's why well, that's one of the things i like about mad tree is true i just clicked on like unfortunately privacy settings are kicking my butt right now um yeah. but yeah i mean true i just clicked on that link in that pdf i showed you this is straight from mad tree's website so um oh. Same thing, like, so I always tell people, you know, like, what do you like? A lot of breweries will share their information. Um, a lot of breweries, like, Mad Tree will give you all their recipes. There's clone books out there. Um, but when it comes to, I mean, we've discussed that before, like, say if you want to enter a beer competition, you can download the BJCP um, app on your phone, and it gives you basically the style guidelines of whatever particular recipe you're uh, wanting to do. Mm -hmm. now it, because now because you're saying contest you know it, it i guess something in my mind and maybe they maybe there's a contest to do this do they ever just say um we all well i know it's a style but can they can you give 10 people a recipe let's say the recipe you just brought up for mad tree if we gave that to 10 people would we get 10 different beers still that would taste different because 10 different people brewed them? Or would we maybe end up with three different beers or, you know, how, how important is the actual person brewing it affect the recipe? I think Chris okay. nailed that one kind of on the head best. Um, you know, there's a lot of area you could you could give. So there's a couple different ways to look at it. One, you could give 10 different people or say, Hey, we're trying to brew this beer. 
and 10 different people are going to have 10 different recipes and they all might drink similar. But mm -hmm. you could also look at it. You could give those same 10 people exactly the same recipe. And because if they have 10 different brewing systems or different ways they like to do it, same thing, even. So it's kind of subjective. I mean, it's a combination of both variables. Um, what system are you using and what ingredients are you using? Um, when Chris mentioned like mash temperatures, I've actually started to debunk that slightly. Um, oh, good. Yeah. So it's like worrying, <laughs> worrying. But one so less much, thing to worry about. Yeah. Worrying so much about your um, recipe is not as much of a, a concern anymore. So, like, I mean, whether that's true or not, I know, um, like, we've, we've, I've done things with customers where they've brought in recipes and we've tried, like, one different thing. And the beers drank very, I shouldn't say very, because we knew they were different, they drank differently. But that's one of those things where if we did, I've never done one where it was true, like, someone came in, like, we brewed one-to-one -one mash temp everything but just back to brewing temperatures or a certain like if you have a counterflow chiller versus a, an immersion wort chiller there's just so many variables that can change the beer and didn't brewlosopher used to do studies like that like way back in the day just like changing one small variable about a particular like, like uh, yeah something like that um but just but also to piggyback on what joey was saying i think if you were to give 10 people the same recipe and have them brew it. I think it comes down to how refined is your palate? Do you know what you're looking for when you go to drink that beer to say that, okay, if I was getting the same beer from the actual brewer versus drinking it from whatever I made versus what Joey made, would you know, would you be able to spot the difference anyway? Like that'd be the true Pepsi well, challenge. I think at that well, point. Okay, and, and Pepsi challenge. What, what would be the, but what would make you, which of those though would make you the better beer brewer? Would it be the person who made it the closest, you know, to what the original beer tastes like or the one who made the best beer? Cause that could be two different things, right? It could be absolutely. And I think that's where that's where I think Joey nailed on the head earlier by saying there's a level of subjectivity involved when you go to evaluate it. Cause if the brewer, if like, if let's say Sierra Nevada, and everybody goes to make Sierra Nevada. And then there was like, I don't know, the brewmaster from Sierra Nevada that was sitting there. And they were like, okay, well, this person's the closest to my original recipe or the original recipe or whatever. Then, okay, sure. That would be your, I guess, metric for saying that person is the closest. But I wouldn't be to say that nobody else came close because mm -hmm. we all had the recipe. We all had the ingredients. It really well, would come down to what Frank was talking about in the chat about like water chemistry and just like the minor things that some folks take into account and some don't. Well, there's other, another variable to it. It's like Sierra Nevada is a great example. You can bring your recipe in here. I'm actually I'm not, uh, it's actually kind of something pretty cool. As of in about one month, I will be the only person in the United States that has whole leaf cascade hops other than the breweries yeah. at a homebrew yeah. scale. So I just signed a contract with a company a couple months ago because I still get a high demand for whole leaf hops. And I've been told that Sierra Nevada uses whole leaf cone hops. So you're going to get some grassy notes from those that you're not going to get from the pelletized ones. Right. But if unless I'm, I'm not even joking, unless you buy them from me pretty soon, I'll be the only place you can even get whole leaf hops at a homebrew level. Yeah. So it's kind of cool so back back to you could come in and brew that recipe for me, or you go someplace else where they don't carry whole leaf uh, cascade hops, and even that variable is going to make back to can you drink it and tell a difference? It's tough to know. I mean, one thing like we we always talk about like the placebo effect, right? Back to like I've had beers where you know that fly flew in there, it got stuck in your wart while it was chilling down. You're like, ah, oh, shit, and you, you know, yeah. pick it out, or this happens, or that happens. I I so as homebrewers, anyway. a we're really, really, um, we put ourselves underneath way too much of a microscope. And the other variable is we know it. Uh, I talked about that someone not too long ago. Like I, I, I think like house painting. I do a pretty good job, but I hate painting my own house because I know every little spot that I fudged up. Versus if I pay someone else to paint my house, I walk like uh, we, we had someone paint a couple rooms not too long ago. I walked in the rooms like, oh, that looks good. And turned around, walked out, never gave it a second glance. Right. Second you're you're going to find your mistake in that room. I yeah. would have all I can look at is every little spot that I screwed up. Yeah. Um, 
but and I think that's to be true in brewing as well. It's like Chris, if you were shooting for a 155 mash temp, but you couldn't get it above 152, that's going to be playing in your head. Oh, yeah. You're like, oh, my recipe said 155. I missed it by three degrees. And I joked to customers like, use a different thermometer. It probably would have said 155 if you use a different yeah. thermometer. Or you, did you take the temperature at the bottom of the kettle, the middle of the mash tun, the top of the mash tun, right. 10 minutes in, 50 minutes in, did it rebound? You know, my, my, my point to that is, as a brewer, we know every little intricacy of mistake or nuance or everything. And so sometimes even in our heads, we perceive it as different than the reality of the situation. No, nah, well, like three degrees off, it's trash. That's not oh, yeah. one. Dump it. Dump it. Don't even waste your money <laughs> on the yeast to pitch it. <laughs> well, Frank, Frank in the chat room also said, you know, even if you get the same grains, if you get those grains from somebody else, how much difference could that factor in? So to answer Frank's question about the different grain or hop vendors is they're all getting the same hops and grains. So I wouldn't worry about that. Now, grains is a little bit different because Different people, they, they actually malt the two-row barley. In most cases, two-row. Hops generally come from the same fields. It's just different companies package them up. And if you dig deep for and far far enough into like the batch numbers and stuff, they're all coming from the same place for the most part. Um, just different companies. And same thing, like they bail them into like 55-pound bales and get broke down to 11-pound bales, so forth and so on. By the time it gets to you in those one-ounce packets, it's probably... So many people have had their hands on it at that point. It's it's tough to say, you know, my, my, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's probably the same hop as if you got it from a different supplier. Grains are a little bit different because, you know, you've got like Proximity, Breeze, Avangard, all that. So those companies have slightly nuances. But back back to batch to batch, even though they call it like a Crystal 20, that doesn't mean it's exactly crystal 20. I actually learned I actually learned a lot about crystal malts from our BJCP class that we did last Thursday. And the crystal malts are basically a blend of many different malts to put it at the 20 level bond. Oh. So they basically it could be there could be C40, C60, C10, C5. They're basically adding all the different vats to each other to make but it, it just a averages out to 20. Yeah, uh, that's what I was told. So, uh -huh. I mean, it's one of those things. And cr even though like, crystal malts are a cool thing, because it's like, well, if I wanted to achieve whatever, and that's where cal grain calculator, that's why I dislike brewing software that does recipes for you. They're a little bit of assumes. I, it, it, I, I call bullshit in two different ways. One, it's back to IBUs. We calculate IBUs. But there's so many things that can perceive as bitter. That the right. calculators won't do. So, like, especially as the hazy styles has become popular, I can't stand it. Or, I don't like to talk that way. I don't like it when I go to a brewery that says, "Oh, this hazy IB IPA is zero IBUs." It's like I get it because the the math of the calculator said because you never put it in boiling wort, but there's definitely bitterness there. Right. And the flip side would be like a like a stout. A stout, if there's like a lot of chocolate malts in there, or black malt or roasted barley, it's going to be perceived as more bitter because of the malts. But the calculators are just factoring hops. So they're ignoring all the other things that are very important right. to... They don't have all the details. The bitterness. Right. So to say, oh, international bittering units, to me it's like, well, yeah, but they're only calculating it derived from hops. And even that, they're only, their old school mentality of like, well, it has to hit boiling wort or zero hopulization happens. Right. Well, I call BS on that because I've had a lot of New England styles that, oh, it's nothing but Whirlpool editions at like 170, but it drinks as bitter, or uh, not super bitter, but it drinks as more bitter than a, log, than a lager that right. I know had 60-minute hop editions, but the, the lager has, you know, 35 IBUs, and the, I, the New England IPA has zero IBUs. Like, uh, that's where I call BS. And another contributing factor I've lost it already. Uh, I'll get back to it. <laughs> so just to uh, like for a CYA type of thing, I would brew a beer and just put like, I don't know, 0. 0.5 IBUs on there. Just yeah. be like, not zero, but there's something mm -hmm. in there. Well, and that was, I just remembered the other one was like crystal malts. Crystal malts are manufactured to, from, like I said, I learned this last week, so I'm still young behind this, but crystal malts, basically they add water to the whole grain. So the starch conversion starts to take place. Yeah. And what happens when we, we turn 
water and the starch conversion takes place, those starches turn to sugars. Then they take those malts, stop it, and then roast them. So they've already been malted. Then they add water to them. And then once those starches turn to sugars, then they roast them. That's where you get your caramel 20, caramel 40, so forth and so on. Yeah. But you could put that into a calculator and go, well, I'm just going to throw two ounces of roasted barley. But roasted barley never saw that water process. It just took two row malted barley and throw it straight into a kiln. So you might get your, uh, what's the scale of that one? The, the, the color, there's a couple different scales for color and they're all leaving my brain right now. But my point is you could throw that into a calculator and go, oh, I'm going to make a zombie dust clone or this clone because all my, my IBUs, everything matches one to one. And you will brew a beer that's not even remotely close to the beer you're trying to to clone and it's back to you you the more you brew and the more that's where truly well one i do believe brewing is art and two when you get to these people who have dedicated their their time and lives into brewing like there it's it's totally different than when you bring a recipe like i have a lot of people and like i don't throw shade at anybody but i have a lot of recipes come in here and i can 100 percent go you threw this through a piece of brewing software 100 percent, and i can just tell by the way they've manipulated the grains where it's like you're trying to clone a beer you like, more power to you. Oh. But I can tell by the integers right. and the amounts and the weirdness of the grains. I'm like, you threw this to a piece of brewing software. And oh, I don't want to hurt oh, people's yeah. feelings by saying you're not going to brew anything close to what you're trying to replicate. Because yeah. I get the number. You went to that brewery's website. You looked at the IBUs. Most breweries tell you what hops are in the beer. And then you looked at the the SRM. That was the word I was looking for earlier. The SRM of the beer. You threw it. And so you start throwing some roasted barley at a beer back to IBUs that's it's not calculating. And now you've got a beer that color wise looks great, but doesn't have the multi backbone you're looking for because you throw through ro roasted barley at it instead of, you know, like a caramel 40. Right. And then the hops you threw were great. But then because you added the roasted barley, now it's more bitter than the IBUs. Like I can truly just look at a recipe and go, you threw this to a piece of brewing software. And like I said, I'm not saying it's bad, but I've seen some recipes where I've truly had to like help some people and say, like, you do understand what you're doing is not making beer. Um, you, th I understand it's like you're newer to brewing and you're wanting to brew a beer you really, really like, and that's great. But when you take, I, I can't tell me times where like a perfect example would be like a, someone will bring me in a recipe for five gallons. It'll be two pounds of two row barley, like seven pounds of flaked barley. And then like five pounds of caramel 20. What? And then like three pounds of carapils. And then they'll grab the hops and yeast out of the fridge. And I want to like, I don't have a nice way to tell people like, this isn't a beer recipe. Right. Like you're not making beer. I understand you threw it into a calculator and it thinks you hit all the numbers of what the brewery said this beer was supposed to be. And you're using the same hops and yeast as that brewery. But you would be lucky to have a 2% alcohol. 3% right. alcohol beer yeah. when it's done. <laughs> two because Flake two barley row. isn't creating the starch conversion. The the caramel mulch you threw at it aren't going to contribute to the grav. Yeah, it's going to contribute to the starting gravity, but man, you got to really look at the final gravity. You're going to have a sky high final gravity. So you're going to have a low ABV, super sweet beer that's not going to be anything close to the brewery. You right. know what I mean? And, and I get it. And that's why I almost don't like brewing software. That's why I tell people, especially nowadays with the internet, like, there's a lot of good people that do really good work at getting pretty close out of the gate and then we can tweak it from there. Yeah. Scaling, right. trying to scale a beer from whatever a, uh, whatever a brewery might provide is so difficult. And like you were just mentioning, Joey, if you just try and take those metrics or whether IBUs, whether it be SRM or any other metrics like that are common to any brewing software and just try and match that, then yeah, you're gonna you're you're gonna be you're gonna you're gonna have a bad time like trying to recreate it. I think I tried that with you like last mm -hmm. year because mm -hmm. I got a recipe from a brewery when I was up in Michigan, and they did I think it was like they had their recipe in like uh, it was scaled for like a half barrel system or something mm -hmm. like that, and trying to scale it down to what I would need for just my little five gallon system it was just like that. Be I think what I came up with afterwards was not the original beer that I had. And it's just, but it's, that's mm -hmm. where it goes back to the conversation we're having it. And then in some cases, your first go at experimenting with a beer or creating mm -hmm. a, uh, rec recreating a beer 
yeah. might not hit the targets that you're looking for. And so it just requires some experimentation. Like where, where are you off at? Are you off on SRM? Are you off on hop aroma? Are you off on flavor? And then you can kind of figure out how you need to adjust the recipe in order to get it to where you want to be at. Well, one, okay. of, the, one of the best things I did early on in my brewing brewing was I did something called smash beers and smash beer stands for single malt and single hop. Mm -hmm. And I truly would choose one base grain, one hop, and I would ferment it with like a clean fermenting yeast. I learned more in that year of doing those beers than I probably learned ever. Cause it's and then for a while there, I would try different yeasts. Um, and all are super, like Frank mentioned earlier about water chemistry. I mean, don't get me wrong. Water chemistry is important to brewing, but man, I haven't even scratched the surface with the other three for, you know, when it comes to barley, malt and hops, I still am working to brew a great beer. Not that water chemistry isn't important. It just means like I ha I still, even as I've been doing this for many years, I still haven't got that deep into the weeds with it. So my advice to people would be back to like what I said earlier, paint from what you know, meaning if you come in here and say, I want to brew, you know, an Amber ale. Great. But don't come in here and say, I want to brew, or I shouldn't say don't. If you come here and say, I want to brew Fat Tire Amber Ale, okay, cool. That's a name of a brewery, which we could probably find a clone recipe that's going to be pretty damn close. Yeah. But if you come in here and it's like, oh, I drank a brewery at some, or I drank a beer at this brewery I went and visited. They have like a half barrel system and you know so forth and so on. Help me. Or the best example would be probably what I get the most of. Help me brew Miller Light, Bud Light. <laughs> uh, Keystone Light, you know, when people get to that, we're just like, yeah. I can get you within the the realm. But it, it it's back to if I put a blindfold on you, I would still take even money, possibly give odds of saying you couldn't identify your light beer of choice. So I tell people all the time, brew a beer because that's what I felt hung me up with the hobby. I was too busy trying to do that um, instead of brewing a beer that. Like I said, when it got to like, hey, I like Blue Moon, so I'm going to do, a, you know, a Belgian wheat um, or whatever style, whatever. Like I said, is it going to be Blue Moon? Probably not, but it's going to be within the wheelhouse of Blue Moon. Right. Sure. Um, well, the so, last thing in, in this category, because obviously we I, I didn't know we'd even get a half hour worth out of this topic. And I think actually two weeks from now, I want to continue because my goal of this topic was that we take time and actually we try to create a recipe by coming up with some ideas maybe. Um, and we'll do that. But because we're still on the grain part and the part that to me, the, the shop I buy my ingredients from, what about the factor of when you crush the grains, how much of a difference can that make? Meaning if some other place crushes it finer, will that make, will that affect my, my final product versus so somebody who doesn't? So I hold strong and saying I have the best crush of any store, period. And because I'm a little adventurous with my crush, I crush it on the finer side. Almost, I can't tell you, I bet you it's weekly where I get someone who'll go, hey, I bought grain from such and such, and man, it doesn't even look like it went all the way, like it doesn't even look like some of it even went through the mill. Can mm -hmm. I bring it into your shop and will you crush it for me? Absolutely, not a problem. Um or, you know, whatever it may be. And it's because if you think of, it's back to mash efficiency. And so mash efficiency is basically the sugars you pull from the grains. Now you have to be careful if you crush too fine, you'll clog up right. your whole brewing system. But most, because of that, most retail stores who crush it for you are going to crush it on the core side because they don't want people coming back and say, give me my money back for my grains because Much you crushed my grains too fine and everything got stuck. Mm. Yeah. So they and I know from being a brew store, it creates a lot more dust when you crush it finely. So to keep their store a little bit cleaner, they don't crush it as fine. Um, or that's incentive to sell grain mills. I crush my grains as if I was brewing with them. Um, over the years, I've gotten more and more finer of a crush. And I ask people a lot of times because of that, like what kind of brew system do you have? Should maybe this time because I'll adjust it in the store. I have sometimes some customers who say I brew in a bag. So I'll damn near turn to flour if you want me to. Or I've had some customers that say, you know, I've got a system with a lot of pumps and recirculation. I, I'm really, and it's a new system. I'm kind of worried about getting a stuck mash. Will you crush a little coarser for me? And absolutely, like I said, I, I can move it here in the store for you. But my default, if you don't say a word to me about it, I would say I crush 
better and finer than most brew stores that you're going to shop from because back to I crush it as if I was using it. Um, I'm not worried about my bottom line dollar and my store being clean. I, I try to treat every customer as if I was brewing that batch of beer. Right. Now, how um, many of your customers maybe don't even know to ask or tell you that? Um, I would say most of my brew in a bag customers definitely know to ask. Um, most of the time where I'll just be talking with the customer and they'll say, yeah, hey, I got a brand new brew system, so forth and so on. Or if I sold them the brewing system, that's when I'm like, you want me to back off of my crush just a little bit um, just to get make sure you get a successful first run. But to answer Chris, Chris's question or comment, um, because of that, if you get those grains from, say, uh, another vendor who are on the core side, you're not going to get as much of your starch conversion. And because of that, your beer is going to be lower in alcohol and going to have less of a malt, um, less of a malt backbone. Because of that, those beers are going to be perceived as more bitter than, mm -hmm. say, if you got it from my store. My store would be probably closer. Um, like I said, I don't want to just generalize everybody, but I would say in 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 a nutshell, that would be the way I would say is like, I'm going to get you closer to cow. It's bad. That's another thing. Like some people truly come in here and go, I get 97% mash efficiency. And I a hundred percent go, no, you don't like, it's like breweries don't get that. I, I wish like in a lot of times I'll say, I think you're thinking brew. What are they using to even determine that? What are they? There's, a, there's, so, there's, there's a formula so I, for it. As much as I like grain father, I blame grain father for that because the grain grain father, calculates brew house efficiency and leads you to believe it's mash efficiency and it makes their system look better. But in reality, it's bullshit. Um, brew house efficiency is factoring a lot of things. Um, mash efficiency is very simply calculated. It's basically how much grain did you have? How much water did you have? And then what was your starting gravity pre boil based on those three integers? And that gives you your brew house efficiency or um, I said it backwards, your mash efficiency. But back to what I'm saying is if you have a, a brewing system that ha gets 60% mash efficiency and I get 72% mash efficiency, once again, we could brew identical beers. Our beer is going to drink very differently. The person with 60% mash efficiency's beer is going to drink more bitter. My beer is going to drink, I don't even want to use the word more well-balanced because that's even subjective to that. My beer is going to drink less bitter than the beer who brewed with 60% mash efficiency because right. I extracted more sugars and those sugars and hops we both know is that is that fun teeter totter right. game we play. So there's just so many factors of recipe management recipe formulation. And another one would be like if you want to brew like country of origin, if you're brewing a German style lager, you're going to use German Pilsner instead of American two row. I mean, so even that, even though I would argue those malts taste in the final product very similar. But back to style guidelines, those are big factors. So right. there's just yeah, so right. many variables. I agree with Mark. We should probably have a part two to this. Yeah. Because um, I, I want to I want to actually try to create a recipe uh, on air live just where we can talk about each ingredient a little bit and go, oh, this would work together. This will work together and just kind of get an idea how you'd create it. But well, whatever we wind up creating, I'll, I'll I'll be the guinea pig and I'll brew it. How about there that? You go. That's all we needed. That's all we needed. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like we should do that where you brew, brew your beer, Chris, and I brew mine. And back to let Mark drink them side by side, and 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 here's the word. Here's the last variable to that. Which one do you like better? Well, right. That might not because even. A, a huge part of it would be back to why I still am at the home brewing scale. Is if I like my beer better, I don't give a shit if you spent seven more hours brewing your beer and double crushing yeah. your grains and doing this and doing that. If I'm happy with the beer I got, exactly. Like, that, yeah. Even if you add steps to the process or you have different brewing systems. I mean, I could back to you could brew your beer as an all grain batch. I could do mine as an extract batch. Mark might say, oh, I like that one better. And go, oh, by the way, mine was extract. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you never, there's just so many. Is, and, the, and that's like the third step. Like, just because you do something to style, it's like right now, I just drink a Saison. This Saison has that farmhouse, barnyard kind of. But if this was a pale ale, I, I would ding the shit out of this beer because yeah. it should be clean. It doesn't have that clean right. flavor to it. But it's back to I'm drinking a Saison right now. It's been barrel aged. It, it's not supposed to based on the style. Yeah. It's not supposed to. So even that is subjective. Like it's, okay. it's it's even like even if we brew two different styles, you could have one a world class beer 
versus one that was a terrible homebrew version of it. Yeah. But if you like that beer style better, you go, I like this one better. So that's the reason why like a lot of people like Bud Light. Yeah, it might All be right. this beer, but a lo- most people like beer with little flavor. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll definitely uh, two weeks from now, we'll go into part two and, yeah. uh, you know, work on building up, or, uh, you know, some type of recipe. Um, Chris, I'll let you check out uh, for I'm, I'm checked out. No one, I, no one needs to get a hold of me. Chris, where can people find you? I think you got like nine other uh, shows and things you do. And then I'll let Joey close out and, uh, you know, and take us out. Go ahead. No, I'm this is the off season, man. You know this. Yeah, I, I know. haven't been doing much of any, much of anything. I'm not writing, no fantasy football stuff. I'm here just chilling. What about the uh, cooking show? Uh, the cooking show that's going on over at 32 bit. Uh, we're off this week, but should be back here in a couple of weeks with more shows, more guests. But so okay. far, things have been going well. But for any other content, uh, whether it be video games to discussions about comics, even just folks like just talking about being young. I mean, there are all sorts of stuff going on right now over at 32 bits. Go ahead and check that out on Twitter at 302WOBIT. Uh, that's where we're at. And if you want to find me on Twitter at Chris Allen FFWX. Take us out, Joey. Peace, y'all.